last road, but that road brought me here. So I put up a fight and told you how to help me. Now just when I have given up, the truth is coming. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Kevin and we have unfortunately come to the end of the AOI conference, but I know that we have been blessed by the numerous amount of workshops that we've had so far. So for our final session, we will be having Pastor John Bradshaw. So without further ado, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we pray that for this last session that you will help all of us to be able to fully absorb what Pastor John has to say and I pray that with the knowledge that we have gathered throughout the conference, let it not remain as head knowledge, but let us help us to apply it in our lives as well. We pray for the speaker that you will use him and guide his lips as he delivers his message tonight. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor John, I pass the time to you. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate you. Uh... Welcoming me, Kevin. It's good to be here. Let me just make sure everything's straightened up. I think it is. I'm joining you from uh, Eastern Tennessee in the United States from uh, Collegedale, Tennessee, about uh, two kilometers from Southern Adventist University. So uh, it's really a joy for me to join you for the uh, closing session of this very important conference. I'm glad to be able to join you. Well, 
I think we just dive in, shall we, and, and ask the Lord to bless us and speak to us from out of his word. Let's pray. Our Father, speak again, we ask you. Thank you for this time. Bless us with much of your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, my brother thought that he was the last one in the door. I have four brothers, two sisters. One of my brothers is a member of the church. And he thought that he was the last one in the door. What I mean by that is this. When he was baptized, he believed that he had been baptized right on time. One moment. He believed that after he was baptized, there was no more time. Not exactly no more time, but he believed this was it. He had been baptized just in time to be ready for the second coming of Jesus. Which is interesting because the year he was baptized, Gerald Ford was the president of the United States. That was the year that Bill Gates and Paul Allen started a company called Microsoft. The year my brother was baptized was the year the Vietnam War ended. And the year my brother was baptized, he believed that Jesus was going to return any day. And that was in 1975. In fact, years later, people in the church would say that Jesus was not coming back in 1975, but instead, in 2015 that year and you may remember the supreme court of the united states made some landscape changing decisions particularly in regards to the family that same year the pope of rome visited the united states and spoke to both congress and the senate and that led many people to believe that Jesus was about to return. I don't know if you remember what I remember, but I recall people getting very excited about this and saying that this is it. This is the sign. Jesus just spoke. Sorry, not Jesus. The Pope just spoke to the Congress and the Senate, most powerful nation on earth. We've read the great controversy, so we know what this means. Let me say this. Can I say this to you out of love? Please be very careful. Please be careful that you don't see the imminent return of Jesus in every current event, in every major earthquake, in every outbreak of disease, such as Ebola or SARS. Every time there's a presidential election in this country, the drums start beating, the drums start beating. This will be the president who will usher in the mark of the beast. And being as there have been 45 presidents so far, some of them having served for more than one term, clearly the predictions have not been correct. I wanna suggest something to you this morning, and it's, sorry, this evening, and it's something that you already know. And that is that we do not know when Jesus is coming back. We just don't know, other than to say he is coming back soon. In 1975, my big brother was convinced that Jesus was returning. And he was wrong about that. He was well-meaning, but he was wrong. Let's agree together that there will be no more prophecies based on time. Let's agree together that we won't look at the 6,000-year statements and use them to try to calculate when Jesus is coming back or when the time of trouble will begin. This is not helpful, and it is always, and it is only harmful. Let's agree together that we won't take the 1260 days and somehow try to cast it into the future and make it appear as though we have special light that others do not have. I met a well-meaning man the other day, and he gave me a book that he had written, and he then told me the premise for the book. He told me that in his heart of hearts, he believes that 
there will be one more president after Donald Trump. Donald Trump, one more president, and then Jesus returns. I asked him how he knew that. He quoted a couple of Bible verses to me. Is he right? No, he's not right. Of course he's wrong because we don't make predictions as members of God's remnant church in earth's last days based on time. We just don't do that. And that's what he was trying to do. So I want to encourage you today that we don't know when Jesus is coming back, but we don't need to. And that's okay. Come on now, let's open up our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We want to be careful with how we treat the, the Bible and the prophecies of the Bible. We are a people of prophecy. And so therefore, we want to relate carefully and respectfully and appropriately to the prophecies of the Bible. We will turn now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. And it says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Now, why was Paul writing these words? Because in the previous chapter, he had written that awe-inducing passage. Right at the end of chapter 4, he wrote, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them or shall not go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he added, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He had just spoken with confidence about the return of Jesus. If this was a sermon and not a letter, you would expect that someone in the congregation would have been fired up with enthusiasm. Someone would have said, amen. Someone would have said, hallelujah. He spoke about the resurrection. And as he did so, he spoke to the heart. You know that he did because he suggested his words offered comfort to the grieving. It's in our grief that we so often ask, when? When will this resurrection take place? When will I see my baby again? A mother asks through her tears. When will I see my father or my grandmother or my brother again? Someone else asks. And when you add to that our particular theological slant, sometimes we just can't help ourselves. When is the mark of the beast going to be pushed upon the world? It has been written that Jesus would have come ere this or before this. And doesn't that make you think? The United States, as we read in the book of Revelation, will have a very important role to play in Earth's last days. So we look around the world and we see moral decay, and we see violence in the streets, and we see all sorts of wickedness, violence of historic proportions. We thought television was a plague, but then the internet has flooded our homes with the sort of sin and temptation we had never even imagined in our minds. And we ask like our little children ask when we are traveling somewhere, are we nearly there yet? And so we say, we are nearly there. Except friends, we must be careful. We must shun date setting. Every so often someone rises up claiming that he has evidence that Jesus is going to return at a certain time based on the prophecies. But no, we know that that is not correct. We know that Jesus is going to return. Let's stay away from speculation. We don't need it. When Jesus is going to return is not the most important question that we face. Now, the Bible says, it's the wicked servant who says, my Lord delays his coming. It might be, could you hit that switch, please? Thank you very much. It might be that Paul had no need to write of the times and the seasons, but he goes on to say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. 
for when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. Jesus is coming back. Yes, he is. And I say sooner rather than later. But let me tell you this. You are glad that Jesus has waited. Yes, you are. Because he waited for you. The longer he waits, the more people like you can come to him in faith and be saved. The longer he waits, the better the chances of your children coming back to church the better the chances of your spouse coming to faith in Christ, the better the chances of your brother or your sister or your friend or that person you study with coming to faith in Christ. The longer Jesus waits, the more time we have to reach the world. Think of some of the great countries of the world where the gospel has not yet really penetrated. Jesus waits. He says, there's still time. There is still time. And so we labor on. Have you heard that old hymn? Maybe you have. Work for the night is coming. Work through the morning hours. Work while the dew is sparkling. Work mid springing flowers. Work when the day grows brighter. Work in the glowing sun. Work for the night is coming when man's work is done. Work. For soon, there will be no more time. The work will be over. That was written in the year 1854 by a young woman named Anna Walker. She was 18 years old at the time. Was she wrong? No, she was absolutely right. The Lord Jesus is soon to return. Jesus is coming back. But how soon? That's a question. Here's the answer. It hardly matters. If you die tomorrow, that's soon. For in experience, that's when Jesus comes for you. You die, you sleep a dreamless sleep, unaware that you are unconscious. And the next thing you know, Jesus has returned. If you live another 60 or 70 years and Jesus hasn't returned, Trust me, you will not think that he has tarried long. Whenever I meet someone who was 100 years old or more, I like to ask them, how long did it take you to reach 100? And I shall never forget a dear lady with a lovely smile, 102 years old. And I asked her that question. And she said, not long. They all say the years still just fly by. It won't be long, and Jesus will be back. Anna Walker's inspiration for that poem, which became a hymn, was John 9 and verse 4. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Our motivation for working for Jesus isn't simply that he's coming back soon. Now, if that motivates you, and it should, then we praise the Lord for that. Jesus urged us to keep an eye on the signs of the times. Know that it is near, Jesus said, even at the doors. But how near? The night cometh. But we must work the works of him that sent us, not because the night cometh, but because it is day. Yes, we know Jesus' return is near, but maybe the song to sing is the one that says, coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. When? We don't know. Not exactly, but that's okay. Let me read to you from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19. It's the parable of the 10 pounds. It's one of those very helpful parables where the Bible writer tells us exactly why Jesus told the parable. It says, and he spake a parable to them to this end. 
that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So we know what it's about. Don't faint, just keep on. Don't quit, just keep on. Don't stop, just keep right on with it. Now we read in Luke 19 and verse 11. And as he, they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Who was Jesus speaking to? Jesus was speaking to a group of Seventh-day Adventists. Now, that wasn't the name of their denomination, but they were Sabbath keepers, Seventh day, and they believed the kingdom of God should immediately appear. The Advent, they believed in that. Seventh day Adventists. So he said to them and to you and me, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said to them, occupy till I come. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Occupy till I come. In the original Greek language, the word used is pragmatio omai. It means keep yourself busy. One translation says, do business till I come. Another says about the same. Another one has Jesus saying, trade with these until I come. Keep busy doing the Lord's work because whether Jesus comes back today or tomorrow or the next day, ours is to lift him up. Ours is to do business until I come. And as those pounds represent talents or capabilities or capacity, Jesus is saying, for as long as you can, for as much time as you have, as long as I have not returned to this earth, it is up to you to be about my business. If you have breath, then you work for the Lord, labor in the vineyard. If we have five pounds, we invest them in Jesus' behalf. If we have one pound, we do the same. We occupy until Jesus returns. I want to encourage you today that God has given you a work. God has called you and gifted you and prepared a place for you to work. I want to encourage you today to be about your father's business. Jesus is coming back. When? I don't know. I say soon. How soon is soon? I still don't know. But what I know is that Jesus has said to us, whenever I come back, I want you to keep busy doing my work until that time. I want to look with you at a passage from the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 3. Now, you know something about the background of Nehemiah. Israel had been attacked. God's people had been taken captive down to Babylon. Well, by now, Babylon is Medo-Persia. Nehemiah says, can I go back there? He wanted to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. The king, Artaxerxes, miraculously said, yes, provided means and provided protection. And so we read in Nehemiah 3, verse 3, a building project gets underway. A work bee gets underway. They start to work. And it says in Nehemiah 3.3, 3, then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests. And they built the sheet gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it. Even unto the tower of Mia, they sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. And next to him, builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zachar, the son of Imri. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassaniah build, who also laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next to them 
repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz. And next to them repaired Meshalem, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabeel. And next to them repaired Zadok, the son of Baanah. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired. But their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. There are 32 verses in Nehemiah chapter 3. And the phrase next to him or after him appears about 30 times. God is trying to tell us something. If ever there was a time for the church to be actively engaged in soul winning ministry, now is the time. We have almost perfected the art of distracting ourselves with important things. If we can learn to do the most important things, we'll be getting somewhere. And did you notice what the Spirit of God said to us? It mentions the Tekoites. They repaired, but the nobles did nothing. The nobles didn't help. God had a special rebuke for the nobles who did nothing to help. That's fascinating, isn't it? Friend, God wants you to help no matter whether you are noble or whether you are a peasant, whether you have a PhD or whether you never went to school, whether you are rich or whether you are poor, whether you are Asian or whether you are something else, whatever you are, God says, I have a work for you to do. I may give you five pounds. I may give you one. So use what I give you for my glory. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a world to reach. And I am not unmindful of the fact that some people are difficult to reach. But here's what I know. You don't have to reach them. You simply need to make yourself available to God and say, God, if you want to reach them, I am available for you to work through. We make ourselves available to God and we look prayerfully. We watch humbly. We pray. And when given the opportunity by God, we share a word. We share an invitation. We share a meal. We make a friendship. We give a tract. We offer a Bible study. We give a book depending on the situation. We give somebody a website to look at. There are so many ways. If we do none of them, we may be on this earth forever, although I don't think that's true. If we do nothing but sit on our hands, God will raise up others to do the work, and we'll miss the blessing of being involved in God's work. Working for the Lord is a blessing. You then know your purpose in this world. You could have a million dollars or a hundred million dollars and have no purpose in your life. Now, if you have a lot of money and have purpose, that's great. You could have fame and fortune. None of it measures up to the joy of knowing Jesus and the joy of sharing Jesus with others. Jesus is coming back soon. The Lord himself says, occupy until I come. Be about your father's business. So when is Jesus coming back soon? Well, let's say one year. Okay, we occupy for a year. Five years. That's five years we occupy. 10 years, 20 years. It doesn't matter a bit. Occupy. That's what the church has been called to do. Some years ago, in fact, it was 1999, I remember. I spoke with a friend. The friend was an evangelist. He said, he wanted to show me a video clip from a movie. Now, I'm always reluctant to share stories from movies in sermons. But this movie was based on a true story about a man who really lived and did something truly heroic. The movie was called Schindler's List. It had been produced six years before. It had won awards. I had never seen it. But my friend said, he showed this little clip. He said, I don't want to show you the whole movie, just this one part. He said he showed it to congregations to encourage them to support evangelism. All right. The man, Oscar Schindler, saved 1,200 Jews from 
Nazi extermination. He would employ them in his factories. And as long as they were working in the factory, well, the Nazis wanted them alive and not dead. This takes place near the very end of the movie. Schindler is leaving his factory for one last time in Krakow in Poland. I've been there, I've been to the factory. Uh, it's a museum now, and it's awe-inspiring to know that some great thing like this took place in that factory, you know. I've been to where Schindler is buried among Jewish people in Jerusalem. And you can understand why they honored Schindler by burying him among their very own people, because he saved 1,200 lives. And as he is surrounded at the end of the movie by people that he has saved, he says, I could have got more out. He says, I could have got more if I had just another man speaks, Oscar. There are 1,200 people who are alive because of you. Look at them. Schindler says, if I'd made more money, I threw away so much money. You have no idea. The man says, there will be generations because of you. He said, I didn't do enough. The kind Jewish man says, you did so much. And so the main character in the movie looks at his car. Remember, there are hundreds of survivors standing around. And he says, this car, they would have bought this car. Why did I keep this car? 10 people right there. 10 more I could have got. He has a lapel pin. This pin, two people. This is gold, two more people. He would have given me two for it, at least one. He would have given me one, one more, one more person, a person for this, one more. I could have got one more person, but I didn't. He breaks down and cries. And as I watched, looking over my friend's shoulder, I could not stop tears from cascading down my face. I don't know that I'd ever been so moved in my entire life. I didn't do enough. I could have got one more. Friend, do you think that we could do one more? Could we get one more? Could we reach one more? When we went on a holiday recently, what if we'd taken some tracts with us? There might have been someone that was open. We could have shared a tract. And maybe God would have led that one more. It might have turned into a conversation, maybe a Bible study, maybe a visit to a church. There are people everywhere looking towards heaven, and they would go if only somebody would show them the way. They would go. Friend, imagine if we started each day praying, Lord, would you bring somebody into my life right now, today, somebody that I can share with, someone I can have a conversation with, somebody I can witness to. God encourages us, occupy till I come. You're on a university campus. You say, pastor, it's very secular. Yes, and there's somebody there who wants the Jesus that you have. Where is that person? I don't know. You don't know right now, but God knows. Ah, in my country, it's very difficult to witness. All the more reason to pray and ask for wisdom and ask God to bring somebody to you. I'm going to share a little story with you. There was a church congregation of four people, four. And they looked at each other and they were all dying off. And the four who were there were all retirement age. A doctor, his wife, and two other older people. And they said, we've got to reach our community or the church will close. This was in a very secular country. They didn't know what to do. They said, we don't have a lot of money. Let's pray. And they started meeting together regularly and prayed that God would grow their church. One day, the lady is in the supermarket. 
and someone approaches her and says, excuse me, aren't you a Christian? Yes. Are you one of those Seventh-day Adventists? She was amazed that anybody knew that such a little church. She said, well, yes, I am. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. The young man said, I've always wanted to know what Seventh-day Adventists believe. My wife, the same. Could you share with us what Seventh-day Adventists believe? A Bible study began. The doctor <clears throat> is in his doctor's office seeing a patient, and the patient says, doctor, I understand you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Yes, I am. Would you please study the Bible with me? I'm wanting to give my life to Jesus, and I'm thinking about Seventh-day Adventism. The church began to grow. They had 15 people now attending regularly. They needed a baptistry. So they called somebody up and from hundreds of kilometers away or hundreds of miles away, somebody drove and delivered a baptistry. He said, what is this thing that I'm delivering? They explained what a baptistry was for. They had a conversation with them. They said, let's do Bible studies. So they did correspondence Bible studies with him. He lived hundreds of miles away. A couple of months later, the man got back in his vehicle, drove to that church, and was baptized in the baptistry that he delivered. Come on now, you can say amen. How did this happen? It happened because people prayed. I'll share another story with you. Just the other day, my friend was talking to a retired doctor, an elderly man, who said, I've got to tell you this. He said, I just got a phone call from a woman in her 60s. She said, I'm thinking about becoming a Seventh-day Adventist, and I'd like you to tell me what Adventists believe. He said, why, do you, why are you calling me? Here's the story. When this woman, now in her 60s, was a little girl, seven years of age, she lived next door, her family lived next door to this doctor. The family knew that they were Seventh-day Adventists. The family had great respect for them. They were good Christian people. And the mother said, these are Seventh-day Adventists. Good people, these people. Almost 60 years later, I'll say that again. Almost 60 years later, the woman in her 60s is thinking about coming to Jesus. She remembers the neighbor. She investigates Seventh-day Adventism. And then she says, I got to call someone. I need to ask somebody. Who? She remembered the doctor's name. She got online and Googled him, found him living in several hundred miles away, got his phone number called up hundreds of miles away, 60 something years later, this man leads somebody to Jesus because of his example 60 years before. Don't give up, don't stop working. Don't stop sowing the seed, something's gonna grow up. Don't stop working the ground, the ground will be ready to receive the seed. Don't stop praying. How many billions of people in this world? 7.7 .7 billion. How many church members? 23 million. If you do the mathematics, you will realize that there's a lot of people to reach. I want you to think about the great cities of Asia. Think about the teeming multitudes and the millions near where you are. Think about Kuala Lumpur. Think about Singapore. Think about Seoul in South Korea. Think about Bangkok in Thailand. Think about these vast and great cities. Think about Tokyo in Japan. Think about, you know, there are other large cities, vast cities. They haven't been reached like they're going to be reached. Do you think God is never going to reach Ho Chi Minh City? Of course he is. He's reaching that city now and other cities are like them. He's reaching them. Do you think he's going to do a greater work? Yes, he's going to do a greater work. Who is he going to use? Well, he may have to use rocks because Jesus said the rocks might cry out, 
but he'd rather use you and me. If we would just give God the opportunity to use us, he would use us. Let me share another story with you. I saw an old friend of mine. He was a church member of mine once. When I saw him, he was 92 years old. He drove to where I was staying. He got out of his car. And as I watched him, he walked over to me, leaning on a walking stick. Larry, I said, it's so good to see you. Oh, pastor, I had to come and see you. I noticed that was a beautiful walking stick. I said, tell me about the walking stick, Larry. He told me where he got it, and it was a lovely story. It was beautiful. It was intricately carved. There were elephants on the walking stick. Beautiful. He said, ah, but pastor, let me really tell you about the walking stick. He said, I had been praying for a ministry. A ministry he had just been out delivering meals to old people. I said, isn't that a ministry? He said, no, pastor. I want a real ministry where I can study the Bible with people. And I haven't been doing that. So I said, Larry, you're 92 years old. Maybe you just leave that for young people and you can rest and put your feet up and watch your flowers grow. He said, oh, pastor, never. You're never too old. I said, well, what did you do? He said, let me tell you, I prayed, Lord, give me a ministry. He said, one day I was reading in the book of Exodus. And there was Moses unable to speak, not well anyway. And God said to Moses, what is that in your hand? It was a walking stick. And I realized God was saying to me, what's that in your hand? my walking stick. He said, everywhere I go, people ask me about the walking stick. So he had somebody help him make a tract. It was a piece of paper like this, folded three ways, something like that. On the front, a picture of the walking stick. What is that in your hand? It said, you open it up, the story of Moses, and then the story of Larry, and then the story of Jesus, and on the back, on the back, there was information about where you could find more Bible study information. He said, I would go into the supermarket, and I'd say hello to somebody, and they'd say hello, and then they'd say, well, that's a beautiful walking stick, and then he said, I would say, oh, I'm glad you noticed. If you like it so much, I have something to give you. And he would give them the track. And then he would lean on his walking stick and he would say, I'll just stand here and wait while you read it. People would read it. And he would say, do you have any questions? If they had questions, he would answer the questions. If they had no questions, he would say, there's information there if you want more information. How many people came to faith in Christ because of what a 92-year-old man did with a walking stick? I don't know the answer. But I believe that when we get to heaven, we will meet people there whose first encounter with Jesus was through an old man's walking stick. Let me ask you today, what is in your hand? Jesus has given you one pound, maybe two, maybe five. What is that in your hand? My brother was baptized 45 years ago. He thought that he was the last one in the door. He now has eight grandchildren. He's old enough to, he's retired now. He's my much older brother. He's retired. He thought Jesus was coming back all those years ago. He was wrong. Is Jesus coming back? Yes. When? We don't know. Let's worry less about the timing and more about occupying until he comes, whenever that day is. And friend, I need to speak to your heart and ask you how it is with you and Jesus.
Have you committed your life to him? And have you prayed and said, Lord, make me a witness for you? Jesus is coming back. All he wants to do is give to you. He wants to give you everlasting life. Beautiful, long-lasting, eternal, everlasting life. He wants to make you happy. He wants to take away your sin. He wants to forgive you. He wants to make your heart new. Oh, I know you struggle with things in your heart. That's why last time we were together, I said, look to Jesus. When you look, you live. Look on Jesus and you receive life. Just keep looking to Jesus. Have you made the decision to give your heart to Jesus? If you haven't, now is the time to make that decision. Can you make that decision now? A decision for Jesus is not a statement that says, I am good enough. It's a statement that says, I could never be good enough. And that's why I need Jesus in my life. Friend, can you make that decision today? A decision for Jesus. Lord, take my heart. I cannot even give it. You take it and keep it pure and live your life in me. Imagine coming through a, a Congress, a convention like this, a series of meetings like this, and walking away, not having given your heart to Jesus Christ. Jesus came to this world that we might have life and have it more abundantly. You can't go back to your university without Jesus in your heart and by your side. You don't want to go back to your place of employment without Jesus in your heart. You don't want to go back to your home and say, I'm here alone. You want to know Jesus is with me. And friend, today, through faith in Jesus, you can pass from death to life. You can have everlasting life right now. You might think, I am not worthy. I'm here today to tell you that you are right. You are not worthy. And you will never be worthy. I am not worthy. No one is worthy. That's why we need Jesus, who alone is worthy. You make a decision today to welcome Jesus into your heart as the Lord of your life. And there's one other decision that I would like to encourage you to make, because right now there are many people viewing at this time, and they're saying, I've given my heart to Jesus. Everything's okay. I want to encourage you, friend, to occupy, to be about your father's business, to be involved in ministry. Anyone can do it. Anyone. You say, do I need special training? Well, no and yes. You can do whatever you feel like God is leading you to do. But I want to encourage you to get training. You know, uh, in that direction, about two kilometers is It Is Written's Evangelism Training School. And sometimes we have classes right here, just down there, downstairs. You know what our evangelism training school is called? It's called SALT. And we have a class going on right now. We have people literally from all around the world who are here. I want to encourage you because you have a SALT right there. Isn't that wonderful? Salt, soul winning and leadership training right in your own backyard. As I said earlier, there are some parts of the world that are very challenging. And I would encourage you to learn how to share your faith, to encourage others. You might say, well, I, I, I could not possibly go to salt for some reason, but you can go back to your church and encourage others. Tell everyone about the committed and consecrated staff of salt who will pour themselves into you and train you and specially prepare you to share Jesus, even in challenging circumstances. If you've never been to SALT, I want to encourage you to be part of SALT right there in your own backyard, led by excellent leaders, working to support and grow the church fully supportive of the mission of the church, working in complete harmony with the mission of the church. 
and working to grow the kingdom of God. You might say, I don't know if I can afford it. Don't worry. If God puts it in your heart, God will work that out. You know that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I speak to salt students here. I say, how was it? They say life changing. And then I see what happens afterwards. Our students have become Bible workers. They become pastors. They become uh, doctors and nurses who share Jesus in the workplace. They become mothers and fathers who share Jesus in their home and in their neighborhood. They become strong Christians committed to Jesus and sharing Jesus with others. Can I encourage you? Can I appeal to you? There's another salt class starting soon. There always is another one starting soon. And I want to encourage you to be part of it. Don't delay. I would even suggest this. You have plans to be an engineer or an architect or a doctor or a nurse. Thank God for those plans. Do salt first and then enter into your secular calling filled with the spirit of God, prepared to witness right where you are. You know, God didn't call you to be a doctor. He didn't call you to be a nurse. He called you to be a witness. And then he might say, as my witness, I want you to be in the medical field. I want you to be a physician. I want you to be a nurse. What I'm saying is he didn't call you to be just a doctor. He didn't call you to be just a teacher. He didn't call you to be just an engineer. He didn't call you just to work in IT, but to work there as the light of the world, to work there as the salt of the earth. Salt will teach you to truly be the salt of the earth, imparting taste, imparting a preservative quality, imparting life to those around you. Friend, are you praying about this? Would you pray, Lord, is it your will that I go to salt and study and learn how to effectively share my faith? What did Jesus say? Occupy till I come. And when I speak to even congregations and ask them, why do you think we don't share our faith more as a people? The answer is always because we think we don't know how. Salt will show you how. Salt will make you an effective worker for Jesus, no matter what your uh, job might be, no matter what your age. You're not too old to be part of salt. Would you pray about that? Would you let me pray with you? I want to pray a couple of prayers. I want to pray that you'd give your heart to Jesus. I want to pray that if God is calling you to go to salt, that you would. Don't resist. I met somebody recently who said to me, 30 years ago, I was called by God to ministry, and I didn't do it, and I've been miserable ever since. Oh, that's not a threat. That's just me telling you that if you want to be fulfilled, allow God's calling in your life to be carried out. There's no other way. God wants to use you powerfully and effectively. And training at salt will give you the preparation that you need to be used by God in a powerful and in a most effective way. Can I pray with you now? Let's, let's pray together. This is the end of a magnificent convention. God has called us together miraculously, not so that we could just go away from this place and go right on with our lives as though nothing happened but so that when this is done, it'll be done in just a few minutes, we'll be able to say, God changed my life. I gave him my heart. I surrendered my life. I chose to give myself to ministry. No, no, ministry doesn't mean that you can't have a family. It doesn't mean that you can't have a life. It doesn't mean that you can't work at a hospital. It doesn't mean that you can't be a pilot or anything else. It will mean that Whatever God calls you to in the earthly sense, you will be the salt of the earth and you'll let God reach you where you are. Come on, we're going to pray together. Father in heaven, I'm thankful for AOY this year. I'm thankful for our theme. I'm thankful for your calling in our lives. And right now there's somebody who hasn't given her life to Jesus young man who hasn't given his life fully to Jesus. 
What that means is that they are intending to face life on their own. This world will be all they have when you offer us heaven, when you offer us your blessing in this world, forgiveness from sin. Friend of God, if you have not chosen Jesus, please, I invite you now to do so. It will cost you nothing. Your life will be better. And you will be everything God, the God of heaven wants you to be. So, Father, we lift up our hearts to you. Some of us are raising our hands saying, Lord, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower of Jesus. And now there's somebody else. They're thinking, I just heard Pastor Bradshaw talk about occupying, being a witness, work while it is day. I heard him say that Jesus has given me talents, five pounds, two pounds, one pound. And I want to put that out there and, and, and give it to the exchanges. I want it multiplied. I want to use those talents for God. Lord, someone is saying that right now. I'm thinking of the SALT evangelism training program, soul winning and leadership training. It would take students from all around the world, all across Asia, and train them in a powerful way to be effective workers for you. Bless the team at SALT. And Lord, let the attendance numbers skyrocket. We need more of our young people, more of our mothers and fathers, more of our older people saying, I have so much time left on this earth. I must use it effectively working for Jesus. Lord, are there retired people who are saying, I have all the time in the world now. I need to learn how to effectively share my faith. There are even church workers who know that they would benefit from being in the SALT program. Lord, speak especially to our, our, our retirees, retired people who no longer work every day, and they have the time, and they have the money. They can do this. And Lord, you'd use them as powerful workers. Speak to our young people, our young adults. Their life stretches before them, and they've heard your call to occupy till Jesus returns. Oh, my friend, my young friend, is God speaking to you? I believe he is. Is God calling you? I believe he could be. I don't know for sure. Maybe you don't know for sure, but now you will pray. You'll contact the people at SALT. Contact the AOY team. Say, help me to learn more about SALT. You go online, right there to SALT's website. I've got to learn more. Send somebody an email. Make a phone call right now. There's someone at your church you know would, would be blessed by this. You're going to take that person by the arm and say, come on, we'll both go. Let's three of us, five of us, 10 of us go. Heavenly Father, you are looking for more people trained. Your servant said that with an army of youth rightly trained, how soon the advent of Jesus would take place. We don't know the day or the hour. We don't know the year. We don't need to. We have been called to occupy until Jesus comes back. Let that be so. Bless our hearts. Lead many of us to salt, to train for your glory. Bless your church. Be with your church leaders. Give them even more of your Holy Spirit. Bless us and keep us now, dear Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. It's been a real joy spending this time with you. I'm thankful that this program has been convened. I wish I could be there. Of course, that's not possible. I'm grateful that this has taken place and God has given us the opportunity to spend this time. Look forward to seeing you again. Until then, may God richly bless you. Thank you, Pastor John Bradshaw, for all that you have shared. And friends, heaven rejoices for all of you who made these decisions, whether online or in your heart. The angels write them down so that they can encourage you. But at the same time, Satan observes all of you who make these decisions as well, whether online or in your heart. 
and the evil angels take note because they want to stop you. We have a Google form for you to fill in if you would like to respond to this appeal. You will need help. Someone to help you to follow up, someone to help you to pray, someone to remind you. If you have not been baptized as well and the previous meetings have touched your heart, please respond on the link as well. We will pass your contact on to a local church in your area. Now, I have a disclaimer to make, and that is that SALT can only take in English speaking students at this time. I do apologize. If you are Chinese speaking, please pray and talk to someone in your church that you can trust about where you can go to study the Bible deeper. Here is the link. You can scan the QR code, type in the link that you see, or click the link in the Zoom chat box. It's, it's there. It will also be posted on Facebook as a pinned comment. It is there already. Please look out for it. And as you key in the link, you make sure you key it all in capital letters and big letters. I am going to play a song now. And as you hear the song, please, please prayerfully consider this decision. When the song is over, we will come back and we will pray. Savior is waiting. 
us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the many decisions that have been made. I thank you for calling and not calling us and knocking on the door of our hearts. Jesus indeed is coming so very soon. And although we do not know the exact time, we know that the signs of the times are near just by looking around us. Father, I pray that you would protect each and every one of these individuals who have responded, that you would surround them from, with your holy angels so that they can fight and protect them from the evil angels who wish to discourage them. And I pray as well for those who have not responded yet, who are still thinking, who are scared, who are fearful of what their friends or family may think or what the future may hold. I pray that you would continue working on their hearts as well. And if you are calling them, Father, I pray that you would continue knocking on the door of their hearts. Thank you, Father, and thank you for AOI. We want to pray that your blessing be, be upon us all as well as we end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.